Welcome to episode six of the Clearly Cloud podcast. I'm your host, Sean Spicer, joined with your other host, Conrad Agramont. And today we've got Vishal Amin from Microsoft, a Microsoft cybersecurity executive who has a very interesting story um, about his transition from being a Marine Corps fighter pilot with special operations experience and his transition and the reasons behind why he moved into cybersecurity. Uh, quite a call. What do you think, Conrad? Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was really good. Uh, you know, there's I think a story of what made it so personal to him and and how he then you know made a career out of it was really really compelling. Yeah, and it didn't hurt that you're both Marines. Well, of course, that's that's the that's the the, the thing. Once you join the Marine Corps, you're you're kind of always connected. So you know, we kind of get each other. Yep, and once you join the army, you're kind of connected that you just have to make fun of the Marine Corps. Well, you know, sometimes you make fun of things that you wish you were part of, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> at least at least we're not Air Force. Well, of course. Well, speaking of Air Force, let's hop into the news. Five, four, three, two, bringing you some news. So it, it's not cloud news. But seriously, did you hear about the guy with the jetpack at LAX? Um, no. I mean, is, are we doing tech jokes already? Uh, right. It sounds Look, like up it's in the clouds. <laughs> it's a guy in a jetpack. Yes. Yeah, so there's actual audio here. Check it out. American 1997. We just passed a guy in a jetpack. Uh, American 1997. Okay. Thank you. Were they up to your left side or right side? Off the left side, like, uh, maybe uh, 300 yards or so, about our altitude. Yes, yeah, so guy in a jetpack outside of LAX. And so Hackaday had an interesting approach on this, is that there was something like this done previously with a homemade drone, a quadcopter, that looked like a guy in a jetpack. Um, so they're still investigating, and I don't know that we'll ever get to the bottom of it, but... Yeah, what was that movie, Donnie Deck Chair, about the guy that tied all the uh, balloons to a uh, lawn chair and went flying and flew over LAX only? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know about that one. You said all the balloons. I thought we were talking about the movie Up. <laughs> this was a little bit before Up. Maybe it was the inspiration. Um, so there is a reason why we do the news on Friday. It has been a wild week. And last night, the New York Times broke a story that Google may be facing antitrust charges by September 30th. They've interviewed 15 different lawyers involved in the cases who are kind of pushing back against uh, <clears throat> Attorney General Barr, who is really pushing to get this down by the end of September. And they say that it's may weaken the case and remains to be seen, but it is... Not the company that I was expecting. Um, yeah, that's that, that's kind of a surprise. I mean, you think of of all the other ones that you know yield a lot of power. I mean, obviously Google does with their their advertising. What are you going to do? Break them up and 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 YouTube? Like, what's what's that really going to do? Plus, it's going to take forever. But I'm surprised they didn't really go after Amazon or 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 some of the other ones that I think probably have a bigger impact on. You know, small businesses and and seem to be a lot more uproar. But I guess they're just finding one they can they can just go after easily. I guess I don't know. Yeah, and given the news that we've been talking about recently, I thought it was going to be Apple, um, but it has been another week for Apple. I mean, it's been a week for every tech company, but Apple put out a commercial. So now the most recent Apple video is not the Fortnite one. Uh, talking about it was. A really interesting commercial. It's uh, people walking through public spaces just announcing things like, I'm researching balding hair. My credit card number is this. Talking about oversharing and the idea is that what you have on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. And they were coming out with uh, iOS 14. And Facebook came out and said, 
Well, with these privacy controls that are going to be placed into the new iOS, uh, it's we're not going to be able to monetize Facebook at all on Apple devices. And it may make sense for us to just stop putting Facebook on iPhones. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's it's all the tech companies that were really working well with one another. They all kind of get big. Now it seems like they're all battling with 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 one another. But you know, in the end, it always comes down to people. What 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 are people going to accept them, and what they're, you know, what they're going to end up doing? What, right. what I found interesting, I know, completely side topic, but remember all the ads from Apple around the facial recognition, like unlock the phone with your face, and I find like they don't put a lot of it on. Well, it makes sense because a lot of times you're out in public, you have your mask on. <laughs> you can't really use your face <laughs> to unlock it, right? You got to put your, you got to put your pin in. That's an angle. That is an interesting angle. You know, uh, it, it's it's it was like, well, you don't need what Android and Samsung has with the your thumbprint. That's whole. Use your face. Now it's like, well, I, re- I really can't <laughs> use my face. So now I find myself putting my pin in more often. Like, oh my goodness, I got I have to do this or I pull down my mask. What do what, what you go do? So it's interesting how one feature, which is so great, and something happens like a pandemic that all of a sudden it's like, Oh, it's still there, but we really can't talk about it all the time. So I don't know, but that was, that I bring that up. Yeah. Well, so, uh, after that, Apple immediately backed up and said, wait, you know what? We're going to put off the iOS, uh, 14 update. And the next day Apple made history and lost $179 billion in the stock market. Jeez. So first company to reach $2 trillion in value, first company to lose $179 billion in a day. Um, so another wild week for Apple. Now, Apple wasn't the only company. Um, the entire tech sector took a massive hit. And between Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Bill Gates, collectively, just these four individuals, not their companies, lost $25 billion in one day. Yeah, I out of all the people that could afford to lose a little bit, I think they'll be fine. Yeah. Um, well, Bezos was on track to be the first person with a net worth of, uh, what was it, $200 billion or something like that. Um, what do you do with all that? You turn it into gold coins. You get a dragon costume or one of those T-Rex <laughs> costumes and sit in a, in your bat cave underneath your mansion and swim in it. Or uh, what was it? Uh, Ducktails. Yeah, I thought that's also Scrooge impressive. McDuck. You know, years ago, all <laughs> that 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 was so remarkable. I think with Bill Gates having just all this money and then just decided I need to start giving more of it away. And I thought that was an interesting turn for for him with Melinda and they've done a lot of good in the world and just kind of taking what they've done with, with tech and still lots of money, keep giving away and lots of money, but they can put it in, put it in for good. But now it's interesting. The tech spaces took a little bit of whacking, but uh, do we feel like technology is going away? Probably not. No, I, I think it was a correction, but the uh, S and P 500 tech sector sector closed down by 5.8% yesterday. Um, and well, again, why we do the news on Friday? Got to catch yeah. it. <laughs> well, some technology kings don't don't last a long time. As as much as you think they're entrenched, they don't tend to go away. Oh, hold on for a second. I got to turn off my Palm Pilot and, uh, you know, see what's going on there. <laughs> Back in the day, that was the first tech stock I ever owned was Palm Pilot and Handspring, their competitor. Um, well, talking about hardware, NVIDIA released their Series uh, 30, their RTX 30 chips. So the uh, RTX 3090 and the RTX 3080. Now the RTX 3090 has 10,496 CUDA cores and 24 gigs of GDDR 6X RAM. These things are beasts if you're a gamer. But what's really interesting though, is that RTX and the AI capabilities inside these video cards are what have enabled the growing amount of deep fakes out in the world. So I've got one of the uh, 20 series RTX cards, great card for gaming, but I can sit and do deep fakes here at my desktop. And it's a little bit slow, 
with these 30 series cards, it should be two to three times faster for me to start pumping out deep fakes, which means that I think we can just program or write out what we want to be on the podcast and just deliver it as deep fakes. We can be the, the clearly deep fake podcast. <laughs> and Are of course, you, I feel like you're deep faking me right now. So what, what about for those people who don't know what a deep fake is? So a deep fake is using um, predictive algorithms in video so that you can take a video of somebody's face and generate what that face looks like ev- in, from every angle and then put that face over something else. And of course, we've talked about it in the past. Every technology starts with porn. This was a big problem where they were putting famous actresses into porn scenes. Um, this has also been done. A delightful, uh, funny one was uh, Donald Trump and Putin put over um, Dr. Evil and Mini-Me doing the hard knock life scene from the prison. It's it's funny. And so there's a humorous aspect. I guess there's the filthy aspect, but then there's also the political aspect. And we'll be talking about that a little bit next week with Chris Peota from the FBI or formerly of the FBI. And so deep fakes are really a major concern because it's like Photoshop in the early days is nobody could really figure out whether things were real or not. And the next day after NVIDIA released their cards, Microsoft has announced that they have a new video authenticator that runs in Azure that is going to be able to recognize deep fakes as well as recognize photo manipulations super fast. And so we're going to be able to at least get some – um, measure of truth in video. But yeah, it, you know, it's one of these things that I think a lot of people feel, well, how's that going to impact me? Okay. I guess politicians, I don't want people to, to, you know, deep fake them. And then I get, you know, misled and, you know, I want a way of being able to tell that, but when it, what the bigger impacts when it starts to reach down home, when somebody can do that as a bullying technique, or kids or mm-hmm. use it or use it to dissuade people for, you know, local events or embarrass other people. So that, you know, it, it, it's not just, Oh, I shouldn't care about it. Cause it's just going to be whatever. And I'll hopefully rely on the, the press or somebody to tell me it's wrong. It can really hurt people, especially as the technology becomes cheaper or available. It's, it can be pretty frightening. And it, I think it's something that probably over the next year or two, we're going to start to see it become more of a local problem. So I think it's, it's interesting. Microsoft slanted a lot of this is, you know, they, they started early on with the, 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 Hey, we've, we're, we're going to have a policy of using AI for good. And we need to have some you know, general agreement of how we're going to use it, but other people are still going to do bad things. And now they're taking that kind of stand. So it's really interesting how Microsoft as a whole has become more of the leader around these areas and kind of trying to stay away from what's happening, but nothing like going through your own monopoly, uh, you know, uh, don't use process. that process. Well, everybody's, everybody's antitrust happy right now. <laughs> well, but they went through their own you know, early 2000s. So I think that probably taught a lot of the organization what's going on and, and kudos to their leadership. Yeah. And we'll be talking about that the week after next. Uh, we will be having someone from Microsoft on. We'll keep that hush hush until next week to announce it. Um, that we'll be talking about Microsoft's work on getting legislation uh, passed globally around artificial intelligence and how that needs to be controlled. And you know what? talking about privacy and Microsoft. Why don't we get to the guest? Let's let's talk to Vishal. Four, three, two, one, having some fun with guests. All right. And today we are joined by Vishal Amin, who is a cybersecurity executive at Microsoft. How are you doing today, Vishal? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. How are you? Doing well, thanks. So um, you're a cybersecurity executive at Microsoft now, but you've had quite the career. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. Um, so I'm part of the security group here at Microsoft. Uh, you know, what I do primarily is my day in and day out role is to work with our customers and our internal teams in terms of building our security capabilities at Microsoft and finding creative and I guess unique ways to implement them um, within our customer base. 
so that they can achieve their goals, their initiatives uh, securely, right? And and that's that's what I do day in and day out. I work with our internal team and our external customers to deploy and adopt and build with uh, Microsoft security solutions. Uh, prior to this, uh, coming from a consultancy background and, and a major, uh, I guess you could say, uh, voice organization, I did 20 years in the Marine Corps um, in a non-technical role, I guess you could say, an operationally technical role. I was a member of the F-18 community, so flew in F-18s for many years. Um, and before that, I was part of the ground side, and I was enlisted when I first joined during the Clinton administration. So I did a good 20 years there, ending my tour as an, as an advisor under the Obama administration and did a little bit on the cyber security side just prior to getting out. But that was the cliff notes there of my, of my career there. That's 20, 25 plus years there in a, in a, in a minute or two. Wow. Well, you're in good company here. Conrad's a former Marine. I won't mention my Army background because I know that. Uh, <laughs> Embarrassing is what it is. <laughs> hey, you know, we've got each other's back out on the field, but yeah, talk a true. lot of smack in the rear. Um, so you went as enlisted and then became an F-8, F-18 pilot. Uh, what was that like? I, th- I like to say it was the best mistake I've ever made. I, I actually went into the recruiting office to tell them to take my name off of a calling list. I had zero backbone and I walked home. I rode my bike there and I walked home uh, from that office with an enlistment to the Marine Corps. Um, and and then from there, decided I, I loved being part of something bigger than myself, right? So I stayed in after that and decided to serve as an officer a little later in my career. So I went through school after September 11th and um, stayed, I was in obviously through that time and before then. And through my schooling, I was afforded the opportunity to to go to flight school and and join that program. And ultimately, after many failed tests and convincing people that even though I was a Marine, I was I was a lot smarter than I looked. I made my way into the F eighteen program and got out here to Miramar um, and got to got to fly in F-18s for many years. And then through normal Marine Corps fashion, got to do a lot of side jobs on the ground and the air, uh, work with tactical data links, collection of data, encrypting data, um, working with foreign dignitaries, things of that nature. So as you can imagine, my my mind was was always I guess you could say Department of Defense focused, uh, never, never worried about the commercial side of the house, but I loved what I did, right? I loved the people around me. I loved the lifestyle I lived. I loved making a difference. So it was a great transition. I would, I would say, you know, it was the, that's why I say it was the best mistake I've ever made uh, joining the Marine Corps. I kind of felt the same way about the military, about being in the army. Um, I had, they call it the poverty draft. I was just looking for college money. And once I was in and actually working with the systems, I was, I did ComSec with uh, LERSD and uh, the U.S. Embassy. So it was a very fascinating time. Um, however, you gave a brief version of your story to me once before. And recently sure. you had a blog in the Microsoft Tech Communities, um, uh, the Humans of IT blog. And that gave a little bit more detail. Uh, what happened for you to leave being a fighter pilot? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Question. So the the you know everything happens for a reason. For me, you know, one of the reasons I I wrote that blog at, while I've been here at Microsoft is in the world of cybersecurity. You know, Ann Johnson, our corporate vice president of cyber at the time, who, who who's still here at Microsoft, that's taken more of a a global role at Microsoft, said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, problems in the cyber world have to be solved with diverse minds, um, people with different backgrounds, with different influences, with different drives. For me, that that was absolutely true. Um, what I do here at Microsoft technically and physically has nothing to do with flying an F-18, um, you know, deploying on the ground with our ground forces or joint forces and, and working with foreign dignitaries. But it has everything to do with how my life was affected through those actions um, that I undertook when I was in the service. One of which was on one of my later 
deployments in the in the Marine Corps through a a joint team um, in Cliff Notes, we were conducting some operations overseas, and and after those concluded, there was a bunch of data. I guess let's let's dumb it down. There was a bunch of data that was compromised, um, and it was compromised through email. It was compromised through a very real and easy click of a button um, through email and through a comp- uh, through a compromised account. And from there, my personal identifiable information was put out there to the world where it was the ownership of that data was then um, owned by the Islamic State, right? The, the ISIS organization, the, the hacking, hacking group within ISIS. And when they received that information, what they did was they reverse engineered all of that PII and who I was, um, even though I had worked behind probably some of the most physical, physically secure barriers and sound barriers that we had. Um, and they found out who I was and what I did and how I influenced their object, objectives and, and their mission. Um, I ended up on the Islamic State Top 100 to be killed list on March 21st of 2015. And, and at that moment in my life, I realized that it was through that incident that my life had changed. And ultimately what that thought matured to was it was the, I would say the lack or of adoption or implementation of best practice security um, that was missed, that put me on the nicest kill list, which ultimately forced me in my own mind to dedicate my life to cyber. And you realize that once it affects your family, your home, your personal life, the ones you love, things that you hold dear, um, that's when issues become real. That's when problems become real. And cybersecurity at that point was no no more something that you layer on top of a budget. It wasn't something that you account for to you know restrict people from sending emails. It was it was something that affected my life, the way I lived. And you realize in my mind at that point, I thought, you know what, cybersecurity isn't something that we should use to prevent people from doing things. It should be something that we utilize to enable individuals to do things um, and empowering them to trust what what they're doing, that it's secure, that they're able to be themselves, that they're able to utilize their ident- identities freely, both digital and, and their actual um, I guess, emotional identities, but that's what cybersecurity became to me. So that's a little bit of my story and why I took exit right at 20 years and dedicated my life to cyber. Wow. Nothing like being added to the kill list to really change, change some stuff around for you. I mean, that's, that, that must've been tough to to see and to hear. Um, I think one of the, one of the hardest things to kind of conceptualize was the effect that it has on you and your family. Um, And the first question I always get is, why would you say this publicly? I could tell you, like most of us that know know security um, now, that once there's a compromise, once there's that B word, the the breach or an incident, and the data's out there, it's out there. Mm -hmm. There's no getting it back. Right, it's sold on the dark web. There's different places, and there's different tools that we can utilize to scan to look for it. But it's still there. So the only way to make change is to, you know, be a voice and share. This is what happens. And everyone will say, "Well, are you off the kill list?" And I can say, "Well, you'll never be off of it." I still get letters every month from um, the DOJ, the the Justice Department, you know, sharing where my identity is move to next who has it you know so there's nothing like a life-changing event um, that affects your personal life that makes you think about security differently Mm. well i can imagine and you mentioned that this was just an unencrypted email that was sent where they was a seed that was it right an unencrypted email that was sent and without you know there's there's thousands and millions and millions of unencrypted emails sent um, a day, I think at Microsoft, I think the new number for us is, you know, we we look at over nine billion signals um, within our intelligence security graph that kind of bounce around and we bounce things off of. But that's the difference, right? What are we doing with that telemetry? Are we looking at it? Are, are we are we 
adopting the right tools? Heck, are we just adopting a tool, right? Are the right, are the right people accessing our accounts, our data um, that we're entrusting? Because even if you have the most, the most, I guess, trusted technology in the world, whether it's Microsoft or not, uh, and in my case, I'm you know obviously solely focused on our Microsoft platform now. But whether it's Microsoft or not, it's there's still a person behind it that that has the motive that you have to trust that you enable to do it. There's still the admin, right? That's why we're minimizing how many admins are out there, who has access to what, you know, at what point do they have access to it? And of, out of all those technology conversations, it still comes back to the human. Um, despite if you look at what. Uh, the, the shadow IT problems, the the HR problems, all, all of these, it comes back to what does the person want, right? And what's their what's their intent? Yeah, you know, one thing that Sean and I we, we talk about all the time and you know, whenever we're doing you know, we're talking to, you know, I'm a customer about, you know, going to GCC high and kind of, you know, make sure you're ITAR compliant in all these areas. Um, you know, we, we, we don't just sell a license and like, here you go. I think part of it is, especially kind of in this group of three here, you know, we were in the military. We have, a, yeah, I think, an appreciation and maybe a deeper sense of, of you know, doing the right thing for, you know, the information that's going to be shared. And we don't take it lightly and we try and make sure that other people shouldn't take it lightly either. And sometimes it's because they don't know and somebody needs to tell them, no, you, you, you do have to secure these, er these areas in this way. Um, I don't really know what it is you're doing for what department, but I know it's special and that's why it has to go in this area. You really should do these areas um, to, you know, protect the data, whether it's, you know, a lot of times, and I thought you brought an interesting perspective, a lot of times, because I was thinking about protecting this, you know, like CUI data, special information, but it's also the people and, you know, their identities and what they're working on. So I thought that was, that was interesting. I think it's, I think it's key when you're starting to talk about things like GCC, GCC high, um, and everything that revolves around it and why you have to even qualify to be part of those, right? It's, it's not the standard protection. You can get all of that protection through a commercial cloud. Mm. Um, but once you start talking about some of those elevated clouds, you're not talking about increased security. You're talking about the ability to monitor your uh, assess, you know, do those assessments, be compliant, be able to be able to have the right people in there when you need to that are trusted, mm -hmm. right? And 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 really putting us putting a ring around, you know, the level of collaboration that you're you're giving your organization and it's I don't think it's any more secure but it gives you I think more validity um, and that compliance piece is huge and it, it, when you work with the federal government it's like I, I would I would I would uh, give this comparison um, anyone can join the military right anyone can maybe be a Navy seal if they really wanted to if they if they were physically able to um, do a couple pull-ups, uh, have the mental fortitude, right? But if I put anyone on there, American Ninja Warrior, whoever I wanted to, um, internally, these, you know, there are still some risk we have to mitigate. We do that with security clearances, and we do that with some of our internal processes. And that's what I look at when I look at things like GCC. How I look any anything can you can you can get anything here to secure it, but by Go into GCC High by investing more into it. Make sure your whole organization's in it. You're you're really investing and in, um, validating for your whole organization and ensuring that everyone is can can take advantage of that cloud, right? And I think that's I think it's key. And you need the right people in there to do the work as well. I think that's that's important, especially when it comes to those GCC High environments and people to understand that hey, we're not just selling a license. We're we know the importance of implementing it. Right. And one thing that Conrad brings up frequently is that most breaches, and I'm sure this was the case with the one that affected you, have no malicious intent behind them. It's a good person trying to do a good job, and they're either not informed or they're unaware of the consequences. Um, and you talk a lot about the human element in cybersecurity in your Microsoft blog. And then you also have a uh, video that you did. Uh, you worked with Okta for a while um, that talks about that as well. Um, how do you feel? that cybersecurity and then the human side of things can inform one another? I think they're 
they're one and the same. Um, you know, the cybersecurity side should be the human side, right? We should look at problems differently. I think when you look at identity, for example, you know, we you have to look at how adopting an identity solution or a platform affects the human, how they how they utilize it, what they utilize it for. Um, if you see breaks in your processes in terms of ease of use, in terms of functionality, you're, you know, that's your human telling you, you know, something's wrong here, if there's friction. And whenever there's a point of friction, there's a point of opportunity, whether it's for a breach, whether it's for another solution, whether it's whatever it is. So I think, I guess the shorter answer is, where the human and cybersecurity kind of meet is probably the point of friction. Um, so I think it's important to have a seamless, um, a seamless workflow or a seamless methodology of how you integrate things like identity or how you integrate, um, let's say, a a cybersecurity solution like a SIM or a SOAR that's that's touching different parts of the organization. It has to be seamless. It all goes back to user experience um, because ultimately it's the user experience and that friction that's going to drive that investment um, and the outcome. That's interesting. I spent a while writing a bunch of blogs around shadow IT and um, oh, it was Valentine's Day was why I decided that I was going to write a blog about why admins should love shadow IT. And it came down that it was an indicator of that friction. And that if you have a handle on shadow IT and you can see what shadow IT, and this is for the non-technical listeners, shadow IT are simply unsanctioned apps. And a lot of people blame it on HR and marketing. I'm in marketing, so I'll, I'll take the hit on that one. That it's, I may not have the exact <laughs> tool I need so I'll go online, I'll go to Google, I'll find that app, I'll download that app or use the web app. And next thing you know, if I'm in HR, I've suddenly put the social security numbers of everybody in my company in a Russia data farm, or I've uploaded my entire subscriber list and broken GDPR and CCPA um, protection. Right. Um, you make an interesting point, right? And especially on that point, I think implementing and adopting another tool is one thing. And it can really help in terms of streamlining and, and and helping with those types of issues. But the other piece is most organizations, including the Department of Defense, don't have the staff to manage and run those tools, um, to learn about them. So when you look at something, let's say specifically like a CASB or something that can manage shadow IT, you know, um, something like MCAS or, or, or whatever you're using, automation built-in automation into those shadow IT processes help reduce friction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, because think about it, friction can go right down the line. If, if you have a tool that to reduce that friction, um, you're creating more friction by implementing another process to assess, analyze, manage that tool set, right? Manually um, inputting the logs in there. And so you, I think automation has a lot to do with it. That's what I love about what I do now, I think more than cybersecurity, implementing automation, machine learning, AI, those buzzwords that we hear all the time into these technologies and into the process to reduce friction, not to make things easier, but to make things a little more seamless. But um, I think it's I think that automation piece is important to to note when it comes to making things seamless and, and you know on one level or platform. Yeah, and seeing the way that the that automation can work to reduce alerts, to actually sort through alerts with machine learning and figure out what the signals actually mean. But I think as that friction moves from a business case where I'm talking, say I want something to send out emails as a marketer, <clears throat> then the friction gets removed there, but then it goes to an IT admin. And eventually the friction winds up sitting in the seats of that automation. Um, and I'm thinking friction, I'm thinking turbulence. Do you think, so you said earlier that <laughs> being a fighter pilot really didn't have anything to do with cybersecurity, but it, I can't help but think there's got to be a parallel. I don't I don't know. You know, I could tell you the max speed of an F-18 
according to Wikipedia, I would say, is 1,200 miles per hour. And that's probably with both engines and afterburner pointing downhill from 50,000 feet and praying that the thing pulls up before you hit the ground, right? But maybe, maybe going fast, being part of something that is unforgiving, where every decision you make um, counts. I, I parallel that to what I do now. I could tell you that my day is just as fast, just as exciting. Um, maybe not as physically fast exciting, but it's probably better that way. My body's already broken a little bit from years in the cockpit. But there might be some parallel there. I, it, you know, being able to have control of something and, and not so much having the control, but every decision you make in that moment is life or death, right? You have to make the best decision with the best information you have available to you. It may not be 100%, and it never is. I think in cyber as well, you're never going to have the 100% answer. But you have to use the data that's around you, and you have to make the best decision in that moment um, for the betterment of the mission, for the betterment of flying, for the betterment of the organization, right? So I, you're right. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, there's, there's, I guess, some excitement in it. I'm sure, Conrad, from your time in the Marine Corps, or you, Sean, I mean, everything that you're doing a lot of times is life or death, even the simplest aspects of making that decision. So I think the, the onus of making a decision um, based on the data in front of you is, is probably is lives through your past as well, right? <laughs> Coming into cyber. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the two of you have, definitely have, um, you know, something way above me on, on being more on the forward side. I was in the back end. I worked on the mainframe and then, and then, you know, the large networking systems. And so I was always in the rear of the gear, but, you know, working on, working on the mainframe. I mean, come on, people want, people want their pay, but you also run <laughs> lots, lots of jobs. <laughs> Uh, so I got to see, you know, just, you know, the amount of data we had to work through, you know, the the data we had to get to to send off to people to to do what they whatever they need for the mission. Um, but, you know, again, so we we I didn't have to really I only had to shoot my weapon a few times, boot camp and to recall. Uh, but that was that was it. But the purpose is still the same, right? Everybody talks about you know the mission, what we have to do it as a unit. And I think in the security side, kind of going back to that, you know. You know, there's been a lot of these tools for a long time, but you have to you had to install lots of servers and you had a lot of people get really knowledgeable on them. Yeah. The nice thing now is that you know it's it's not the flick of a switch, but pretty damn close. But you still have to understand how it all kind of pieces together because you know what you were saying earlier, which is you know we we want people to be productive, right? Because this is how they they can advance what they need to go do for the mission. But we need to protect them in a way because sometimes they don't know they're doing bad things, right? but some people are trying to attack you. Sometimes you just leak it inadvertently. You have to control all those situations as much as possible. So there's the access, the accessibility to, to secure things, have these services that have AI is right there, but it takes somebody to say, you're right, this is, well, do we, do we add more security or should we do this other feature? And they're not the same. Right, they're 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 bolted together. You you want to you want to live with those features, and you need to make sure that they're secure. It's an and, yeah. it's not an or. Right. I mean, if it if it was if it was an or, then every time you put your address or your phone number in the internet, right, it would go to everybody. Mm -hmm. But because it's bolted on, you know, in some aspects versus others, you may get more spam, or you may get you may more you may get more first class junk mail in your in your mailbox, right? Um, if it's if it is a if it is an or versus an ants. and I think you're absolutely right. It's it's something you have to look at together, and but it's got to be easy. I'll be honest with you. It's not you know if you go if you look at things like Secure Score and you go to 100, percent you're probably in an organization that's so locked down that it's hard to get anything done, right? So there's got to be a risk assessment associated with it. There's got to be a risk score. There you've got to be able to. It doesn't start with Microsoft, you mentioned, you know, so the, when I went public with my story with Okta, it doesn't have to be with an Okta, it doesn't have to be with the Microsoft or any of that. You know, it starts with your organization. What is your risk appetite within the organization? How are we how are we assessing productivity and security? Are we truly bolting it together or are we looking at them separately? Um, 
the number one thing is still that I see from a Microsoft perspective is you'd be surprised how many organizations still do not utilize MFA. Mm. Right. In the most, I would not be surprised in the most basic capacity, um, even, even for, you know, their privileged users and, and, and their high, high targets. It's not, oh, but, it's such, but it's such a pain. It's like, I just want to get email. Why do I have to do this extra thing? Right. right. So, <laughs> but if you look at you it, hear. right. I don't, I think the, the conversation when you, when people start throwing buzzwords around like zero trust and, um, and now, everyone's talking about MFA, I think you have to expand the conversation to, okay, well, I don't want to do MFA, but how am I going to secure this user and make it frictionless, right? Like we were speaking about earlier. And you have to extend that conversation out to things like conditional access. You have to spread that conversation out to things like zero trust and how we do that more than just passwords and and but, and make it easier for people. But, but isn't the point of adding friction, it's not a bad thing. Right. When we tell customers, you're going to go here to GCC High, we have to deploy these things. Yes, you're going to have MFA and it, things are going to be different, but it's supposed to be. It's, it's, not meant to, it's not meant to be super easy for some of those things, because if it is, guess what? You're right back where you were. Now, it shouldn't be hard. Right? It, shouldn't, it shouldn't be challenging. It shouldn't be preventive, because I think to your point, if you are... So like, if you want the most lockdown server, like unplug it, dig a hole, pour concrete on it and fill it in. Super I, secure, but I can't use it for anything, right? Can friction is it? good. You're yeah. right. Friction is good. It, it, create, it creates, it creates change. It creates opportunity on good and bad, right? It's, technology can be done. Technology can be used for, I mentioned in the plot, blog, good and evil. And it's our... It's our job to utilize it for good, but embrace the change as well as needed. The friction friction is right in the middle of it. I, I, I wrote I wrote I read a book by Napoleon Hill years ago that um, a good friend and a mentor of mine asked me to read as called Outwitting the Devil, and it's it's all about frame collision and flick and, and friction. Um, so it can be it can be looked at in both both lights. You're absolutely right. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, I think that friction and what we're talking about, there's both sides. There's like, they talk about the balance between productivity and security. And I did a uh, comsec at the U S embassy and 90% of what I did for comsec had a foundation in opsec. So comsec is communication security. I did phones and satellites, but then opsec is, do I walk the same way to work every day? Um, am I aware of who's around me? Do I have operational awareness or situational awareness? And I worked with a team of three people that were in the army and four people that were quote unquote state department, um, that worked right. in a let box, um, you know, the embassy and my boss that I reported to, cause I was assigned to the embassy. He was state department and he taught me a lot about OPSEC and we just had a rule is if we weren't, and he called it behind the Marines. So we had Marine guards at the front gate and Marine guards at the front door. And then once we we're up on the third floor to get into the secure area, we had another Marine. And if we weren't behind the Marines, the only thing we talked about what our job was, was shining boots and pressing pants is that was it. And I got to know this guy really well on a personal level because when we went to lunch, we didn't work at the embassy. We talked about places we traveled. We talked about what high school was like, what movies we liked. And we never talked about work or what we did outside because you never knew who was listening. And that being behind the Marines caused it was friction because, oh, I've got this idea at lunch. Well, I can't talk about it now. But it made me constantly aware of where I was talking about this privileged information. Um, and I think that's where MFA and things like that is, okay, now I'm behind that perimeter and I know I'm safe and I'm working in a secure environment. And it enables you, it enables you to do more, right? You can, you can speak up. That's a great, great example um, of relating it. I mean, I guess I can ask you guys as you guys are a very trusted partner of ours and, and, and you guys work with, hundreds of customers, um, more so than probably I do personally, you know, where outside of MFA, I mean, what's, what's that next conversation look like with, with majority of these customers? I mean, you mentioned working with ComSec, um, 
you know, Conrad, you, you mentioned, Hey, I work in the, I, I worked in the back end. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the organizations that you guys work with now have the same types of individuals working in their back ends and working, working within their data centers, working within their environments. Um, and, you know, MFA is not top of mind, but let's say MFA was a conversation you guys are having with them. What are some of the other security pieces that you guys are hearing within your customer base around security when it comes to working behind um, secure areas, enabling them to work? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a broad topic. I, I remember this from, was it three, three, almost four years ago when we were just really starting to, uh, as Microsoft was getting better at the tooling, like Intune, like five years ago was, it was not ideal. <laughs> We've told customers it's it's not the right route because there just wasn't enough. But about three years ago, it really was, and there were more pieces, and you could just see the focus, the 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 additions that are going to it. But and before we added that in, I had early on some other salespeople, and they would say, "Well, look, I, I I'm not so sure people want to buy this." I'm like, "Well, why why yeah. do you say this?" So because they don't ask for it. What do you mean they don't ask for it? <laughs> yeah, you know, like you want to migrate your mail, like yeah. Do you guys want to do some security? And they're like, "No, I, it's on Microsoft thing. It's 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 good enough." So, you know, we don't ask for it anymore. It's like, you have to do these things. Yeah. You have to do them. Now, you, you, if you're in a regulated industry or if you have PII and you say whatever, th those things create pressure that, that forces people to go through it. But I tell them, like, compliance and security aren't the same thing. You can, you can meet your compliance requirements. 100%. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you've secured it even better than you possibly could. And, and, and now what's the risk? Uh, so, you know, one of my little statements that I make, I got a bunch, but you know, <laughs> business, businesses buy for three reasons, make money, save money or mitigate risk. That's it. They don't do it for funsies. They don't do it because they like it. It's got, you know, is this thing going to oh, create a store? I'll spend money to sell more things. Or can, if I get this, is it going to save me money? Or if I make this investment, will it mitigate risk from you know, that normally leads to losing money, right? Losing contracts, losing data, you know, have to go on the press. These are not good things. So very rarely do you find a business now where those things aren't important, but specifically for those customers that are more government related, we're on ITAR, uh, you, you, yeah. you're, you're working on, you know, some of it may not be, you know, top secret, but it might be, you know, controlled and classified information. It's important do your due diligence uh, to go do it. And so we, we, it's not, but there is no one switch. There's no like, Hey, can I, can I just give you a thousand bucks and just, you know, hit the security button for me. It's like, no, there's lots of things, your phones, your desktops, your apps, how they get it when they get an app gap, because they put on USB drive, take it home, open it on their Google drive four years later, if they can, that's probably not very good. That's it. Data loss protection, document tracking, revocations. Um, that's the one where I can hear people's eyes open when I'm talking to them over the phone. Um, once they hear that they can control their data and even when it's outside of their environment, that people get really excited about that because it's just got that immediate yeah. connection to business outcomes. Let me give you a really fun example. <laughs> so I was talking to someone uh, uh, last week about this and COVID-19 comes and takes over everyone's lives and they say, all right, well, our number one goal is DLP. Um, you know, one of our initiatives right now specifically and dives out of DLP, but really is protecting all that data that's going home with all of our with all of our employees. And our employees have never, in this particular role, had the opportunity to work from home because we've physically confined them in an area. They're within our network. They're on site. We can, we can control all the documentation. We know where it goes. But now it's affecting, in Conrad, it's affecting their revenue, right? They can't produce the content that they needed because the people that produced it is, are no longer under the inside of the box, right? So now the next thing is, hey, we've got to enable the people that help us make money to produce this content. So they start enabling them and they're at home. But all of a sudden we've run into a new set of problems. They're not on the same devices. They're not on controlled, they're not in a controlled workspace, right? They, they don't know 
if they're sharing it internally, externally. So they, they fix that problem. Now they say, okay, well, we, we can do remote detonation. We can look at where things are going. We can, con we can containerize how you're accessing this content. Hey, we have another issue. What we can't control, and this is where you have to really start getting creative, is we've got families at home, and this content is so sensitive, we can't afford for it to get out. Mm -hmm. So now, how do you control kids, teenagers, people coming by your computer and looking at what you're working on, right? Um, taking pictures of it with their phone and, and getting getting out there. I mean, when you talk about DLP at enterprise level organizations where you're you're affecting millions and millions of dollars of revenue, um, what can how do you protect people from not just protecting that content and making sure that it's secure and it's and you know where it's going, but things from outside your control of of someone taking their phone and just taking a picture of your screen while you're away. I um, mean, that's where you have to get creative in terms of timing. And, you know, you look at things like Windows, Windows Hello and some other pieces, but it's a really interesting conundrum that we're in now. And it goes to that last, last piece that you said, Conrad, what was the last one? Mitigate risk, right? Mm -hmm. So you can only, again, you can never go hundred percent, but you have to be able to show to the stakeholders and the stockholders and, Hey, I might not be able to, we might not be making money, right? And we're trying not to lose money because we're enabling them. But what's what? What can we do to mitigate risk? And that's when that friction right there is going to start creating opportunity for growth, whether it's Microsoft or um, partners or third-party pieces that we may have to integrate. But it's really I, I love those three points that you you built out because no matter I was just spelling that whole scenario out in my head, no matter what part of that scenario I'm in, whether it's them not being in the office, now working at home, working on unmanaged devices to working on maybe managed devices and everything's protected. And then you just have, you know, your teenager walk by and just take a picture of it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the catch all for me is mitigating the risk. Mm. So that's, you know, it's 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 funny what the kind of problems that you see now in light of COVID and 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 the scenarios that we're in now, with um with the current world world events. Yeah, it was funny. Um, several years ago, Microsoft pitched really around managing uh, devices and and data, saying really it's the identity. Like the identity is 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 the is is what your is the real life perimeter, right? It's protecting that person. And even devices are quote unquote not people, but they're 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 an identifiable object, and you have to do it there because the, the firewall is no longer in the perimeter. Like you're crazy, you have all these firewalls out here. <laughs> like, we're so safe, and then it's oh everybody's <laughs> working from home. Son of a gun. <laughs> they're still safe. The people aren't though. They're outside. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just yeah they're all they're all hanging out outside, and it has it has changed and. Uh, you, but even there, well, should get rid of firewalls. No, you, you still want to protect where you can at every point in which you can. But it is a very broad area, and they, you, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna roll anything out, just like when we do a migration, we tell them, look, we're gonna we're gonna bolt on the security pieces first, and then we're gonna migrate it in. Well, can't you do it afterwards? My favorite, my favorite thing, like you don't buy a million dollar house and then put locks and doors on after you move in, right? It's already right. there, locks and doors, cool, open the key, now move your stuff in because you feel safe when you close and lock the doors. So you can't do security afterwards. And again, it, some of the friction is good because some, you know, a lot of people in the organization have to understand why they should do this and understand the practice that they're supposed to do it. Because, you know, one way or another, it's going to happen and you don't want to happen where they have to do a, 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 you know, a stand down and everybody has to stop working because they got hacked and they have to go in the news and everybody now has to get trained and it's embarrassing. Yes. Why not take control and just do it from the very beginning? You're going to have to do it at some point. I, I love analogies, you know, for me, like in the F-18, you don't, you don't go fly an F-18 without buying your life insurance first. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I might, I might, I might have done it if you would have given me the opportunity younger. But um, obviously, you have to have all your checks and balances done before you strap into the cockpit. 
you know, <laughs> just God forbid, uh, if anything happens, I think I had a friend who, who, you know, bought an engagement ring and didn't buy insurance and lost it. Right. It, you, oh. you have, it's, I mean, go figure. That was an expensive, expensive day for him, but you have to have some insurance on your digital estate. And more importantly, it's not your digital estate, your people, right. It, by, by bolting it on, you have some insurance on your people. You're taking a bet on your people and you're mitigating that you're mitigating the risk. Right. So I love it. It's it's a great analogy. It's a good way to do it. You don't see many organizations, a lot of times organizations that I work with and some of the some of the partner organizations that we work with, you know, the customer customer will say, Hey, this is what we need done now. But I think it takes some moral courage. Um to be able to stand up for what you believe in and either say no or say, no, this is the right way to do it. And, um, and you have to, you have to do the security pieces first. I think that's foundational. And, and, and a lot of organizations say, no, let's, let's, let's collect the purchase order. Let's, let's collect the money. Let's deploy X, Y, Z. And then we'll talk about security later. Um, and just to your point, Conrad, if you do that, what happens next? Right. And, and you've probably seen it. That's where, you see customers asking, right? And, and and for the need of getting that security in first, that's probably some of the trends that you guys see um, over at Agile IT. Yeah. I mean, it, the one of the things that, um, all, all my little say, say, sayings are coming out, but one of, is is a you know, customer saying, hey, we have this deployment on-prem and, and we're going, we, we have a little bit of cloud and you know, can you do a security assessment? I was like, oh, well, what, what do you have? And they go, well, I think we have this, but I'm not sure about this. I'm like, oh, well, I'll give you the answer right now. It's not good. So <laughs> so let's talk about what we can do and not waste our time around those other areas because I'm just going to give you the same result. It's terrible. So let's go. Now, if they have some practices in place, they have some technology, but they need guidance on what to do next and how to refine it, very different. But, you know, we had customers years ago that were, were you know, all on-prem and they had no idea what their security was. And the funny thing was, they had no idea what their security posture was on prem. They really didn't have any expertise on it. But they 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 wanted to say, they wanted to do an assessment and then do a gap analysis a, a gap analysis on what they don't have compared to the cloud. Because they're like, I'm not sure the cloud is going to be better. It's like your nothingness you think is better than what you know. Pickup cloud provider. In this case, it was Microsoft's. Like, well, we're just not sure. We did not move forward with that customer. <laughs> I think it's important to leverage on strengths and weaknesses of each other. You know, one of the greatest pieces that I saw um, that I'm seeing more and more now it, uh, of of cloud adoption is organizations that have an incident, and those incidents get reported back. Um, so that everyone else in their industry, in their vertical, is now also protected from those incidents, mm -hmm. right? Within a matter of seconds, it's not just hanging around in your on-premise environment, but now all of a sudden you're not just doing what's best for your business, but you're doing what's best for the industry. So one of the cool things about Microsoft is, is enabling the cloud, not just for growth, but for a lot of that sharing of intelligence and data and being able to automate automate some of that so that you can mitigate the risk, like you mentioned us, your third bullet point. Um, going to the cloud is more than just scaling and saving money. I think it's also with the right with the right organizations doing it the right way, it's enabling a lot of good. You know, it's creating a lot of fair business practices and being able to being able to drive organizations and take advantage of best practices amongst each other. Um, so cloud is cloud is more than just a technology innovator. It you know it allows us to communicate with one another silently and 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 take all the bad and generate good out of it to protect each other. So it's a cool thing you know when we talk about moving to the cloud and there's a lot of a lot of pieces not do that. And I know this isn't meant to be a technology conversation, but that's that's really how all these products act together, right? You have to be able to take all the signals and piece them together so that you could see all of that without 
without feeling burdened to do so and for for it to automatically help each other out. I mean, if you tie it back to anything we do in life, whether it's my career in the cockpit or you know career in technology it's it's how things work together and and, and share and communicate with each other I, I i said this to my marines many times uh when i was in and even after i i retired in in the organizations i've been part of um and you've you, both of you've probably heard it you know it's when you jump into a debrief or a brief when you jump into a conversation someone always asks what's the key points to success here and i always used to say it's the three c's clear concise communication something i lack i think <laughs> but being able to clearly and concisely communicate with each other and that's the same with the technology it has to be able to communicate across the platform with each other to send messages and 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 you have to be able to capitalize from it it all comes down to that so yeah just this morning uh norway um did, well it came on computer weekly there was a story that norway is looking at the getting the government to support herd immunity and cybersecurity. And it reminded me of a story i heard last week about the u.s cyber command doing a kind of lean forward approach into security and we went up to montenegro uh, as the u.s as the military in october of last year in order to help them fight against Russian interference so that it would inform what we do. And I like that you say that about how the cloud brings that together, that we all defend each other. Um, so we've, we have gotten a little bit technical here and we're coming up on time. Um, for individuals who don't work directly in cybersecurity, um, what would you want them to take away from your story? You know, the number one thing to take away from what happened to me is cybersecurity is not the responsibility, I think, of the technology. Um, and for individual it's it's the responsibility of the people. And for the for those of you for those of you that are listening um, that don't work in cybersecurity, you are probably the most influential and knowledgeable individuals around why this is so important. And that opinion, that input, that lack of understanding um, that friction is important to verbalize and inject into the conversation. I would empower people that are non-technical, non-cyber to speak their own language to the tech folks in the department, to your, to your leadership and express how innovation, how um, how your technology platform is influencing you and 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 how it affects your day to day i think those are some of the most important conversations to have if not the most important conversations to have because as we started this conversation cybersecurity is not about a firewall it's not about advanced threat protection it's not about the intelligence security graph it's about the people and it's about where your where your life is and how how it affects your life and the saying doesn't go true to everybody because nobody works normal hours anymore but i used to say it's not about the nine to five it's not about your budget it's not about work Cybersecurity is important when it affects your five to nine right when it affects your family for me when when i was opening up when I was turning on my car before I put my kids in it, when I was looking at black cars outside of my house and I couldn't live a normal life, um, when I ended my military career um, to dedicate to cyber so that we could be whole and normal again, my story is no different than those that aren't in technology in every organization you guys work with. It's it's literally about the people. So hopefully that me message resonates with some of you. And I, the one ask is I empower those individuals to go and force themselves on some of these conversations or listen in. I think it's I think it will be extremely valuable not not just for them but for the individuals that um, they interact with. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Vishal. That has been really insightful. Thank you for sharing the story with us. Um, next week, we're going to be having a former director of the FBI on as a guest, and he's going to be talking about some of those impacts as they relate to school children and politicians. 
Um, so I think this is starting a very good conversation about what the impacts of security are. And really, um, your story is so powerful. I'm, I'm humbled to hear you and have you here on the podcast to share it. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that was a fun conversation. Yeah, that was fun. That was good. That was good. Well, it was a pleasure being here. And thank you uh, both Conrad and Sean for having me. Um, please, uh, please let us know if, if you need anything from us. But again, this was, this was so much fun. Thank you again. Have a great day. Holy smokes, here comes a really bad tech jokes. Be funny. No. You think it's hilarious when you ask me. You'd be funny. You... You said that I was supposed to be the straight man and you were supposed to be the funny one. I can't be funny. I'm over here like a machine. I'm just ones and zeros. Yes or no. So, Conrad, do you know that there are 10 types of people in this world? Hmm. Those that understand binary and those that don't. That's terrible, but it's very true. (laughs) <laughs> but very true I you have know, to these... explain that one to Spencer one zero come on man <laughs> it's like if you have some joke and to talk about floppy disks what's a floppy uh, the I, the save icon button that's what that's what the floppy is uh, let, me, <laughs> let me let me pull one out of you no it's a terrible one uh, you know actually the other day I was I was uh, I was at home and you know I got a bunch of computers and, you know throughout the day I have like a laptop iPad Computer, I kind of go fluidly around me. I love working in the cloud. Maybe that's something we can talk about another day. But you know, one day I, I had one of the computers, and I was like, "Where did it go?" And I was like, well, "Where did where did it go? How did it get out?" He used Windows. <laughs> the next time we interview each other, I'll have to tell you about the time I kicked the monitor out the window. <laughs> now I have flashbacks to uh, oh, what is that movie? Oh, why can't I think of it right now? Uh, the one where they, yes, the one they broke up the printer. Every time I see a printer go in the trash, I'm like, why don't I get some goggles and start make my own video on that? Uh, well, when this is all over, when we're able to go out to places again, I know there are some rage rooms around here. And by then, hey, maybe all of my computers will be out of date. <laughs> Unless you're right. Windows 10, it lives forever. <laughs> You'll still need faster computers. I'll have to get one of those new GeForce cards. Well, Conrad, thank you very much. It's been another great episode. Everybody, give us a like and follow if you're checking us out on YouTube. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Clearly Cloud Podcast. Somewhere out in cyberspace, there is-